Recording the Pakhani Telagi recording. Good afternoon, participants. I welcome you to session 10 of BAR 2020. We have our external expert, Mr. Nishant Sinha, PhD scholar, Translational and Clinical Research Institute, Newcastle University, UK. A brief introduction about Nishant Sinha. Nishant Sinha is a final year PhD student in neuroscience at Translational and Clinical Research Institute, Newcastle University, UK. He was awarded Master of Science in Dynamical System and Control Theory from Nanyang Technology University, Singapore in 2013. His undergraduate training was in electrical and electronics engineering from Sikkim Manipal Institute, India in 2010. Before PhD, he received four years of experience in research from Singapore, working as a research associate in computational neuroscience at Nanyang Technological University, and briefly as a research intern at Agency of Science and Technology and Research. So I welcome you, sir, to the workshop BAR 2020. The title of his talk will be Personalized Brain Modeling for Precision Medical in Surgical and simulation therapies in epilepsy. So I would like to hand over the session to Nishan Sinha and kindly presentation. Yeah. kindly uh, carry on with his talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Risha. Thank you, Rajiv sir. Uh, let me, let me, uh, Share my screen. All right. Okay, so hopefully you are able to uh, see my screen. Um, is that is that correct? Sir, your slides are visible. All right. Thank you, Risha. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajiv, sir, uh, for inviting me for on, on this uh, to give this workshop. Um, so as the title suggests, uh, my work is about developing personalized brain models uh, for uh, treatment uh, in uh, uh, epilepsy, specifically related to surgical and simulation therapies. Um, so, um, I th sorry, I think I think your mute uh, your your speaker is uh, on. Okay, great, thank you. Right. So. Uh, Maybe some of you know about epilepsy and other other some some other people you you might not be aware of this disease. So to put us all on the same page, I'll first give a brief background of what this disease is, and uh, then I will uh, follow on with uh, presenting some of my work where I have uh, um, applied uh, different interdisciplinary approaches uh, to address some of the challenges in this field. So epilepsy is a neurological disorder, and uh, uh, in this disease, seizures occur uh, at unpredictable moments. So these are unprovoked seizures, and it is not uncommon. There are approximately 50, 65 million people in the world with epilepsy, and 10 million uh, of them are in India alone. 
they are often associated with depression cognitive deficits and sometimes sudden unexpected death so to put things in perspective i have uh, taken an example of how a uh, seizure uh, look like uh, so this is a patient uh, he is about to have uh, about to have a seizure and uh, um uh, like you can see now the patient is is now he is stiffening and you can see these motions uh so this is the moment uh, so this is this is a seizure and you can see it's so difficult to watch uh and a typical seizure would last for a few minutes uh before it stops uh, you will see that the patient uh would the slowly the seizures would stop and then the patient would uh, slowly return back uh to consciousness so there are different types of seizures uh these sort of tonic clonic mo movement that happens uh in this type of seizures uh it is one type of other there are other type of seizures in which these movements uh tonic clonic movements may not uh, happen and yes and this is how this is an example of a seizure and this is how uh, it looks like so how is uh, actually uh, seizures epilepsy diagnosed and how it is treated i'll just give you a very high level overview of this so this is an example of a of a patient uh, of an eeg cap where the uh, these each of these electrodes are recording from every different brain areas and the moment when the seizure occurs then these discharges which are high amplitude and markedly uh, and quite different from the background appears on these eeg electrodes so depending on on how many channels uh, it is it is uh, depending on how how widespread uh, these uh, uh, seizure activity appears we can either categorize the seizures as being focal or generalized so in case of uh, focal seizure this is the section of the brain uh, taken from a part here as shown so in cases in case of focal seizures the seizure would start typically from one particular area of the brain and then remain either limited to that area or would then generalize to different areas in this case the seizures do not generalize to different areas uh, in generalized seizures however on the the electrographic signatures of the seizures suddenly ap appears on all the electrodes at the same time and then the seizures would continue when the patient is uh, having this ha having the uh, seizures and then it suddenly stops so the primary treatment for uh, epilepsy is uh, lifelong anti epileptic uh, drugs and uh, fortunately this works for 60 to 70% of the cases a neurologist would typically choose from a narrow or a broad spectrum anti epileptic drug and then uh, often there would be a combination of drug that would be tried uh, if there is sometimes only one drug uh, may be sufficient to stop the seizures and then that is called a monotherapy or with two drugs bitherapy or three or more drugs polytherapy these drugs have some side effects and sometimes these side effects are worse than seizures so uh, choosing the right set of drugs and uh, having an informed uh, opinion from a neurologist and a correct diagnosis is very important now this is a study which shows how many patients typically become seizure free um after uh, after the different uh, regimen uh, uh, dif different treatment different drug regimen so we can if we focus here then we see that with the first drug regimen almost 49.5% of the patients were seizure free this number uh, Means the remaining of thirteen point three percent would be seizure free with second uh, drug regimen, and with the third drug regimen, almost three point seven percent of the remaining would be seizure free. Uh, 
beyond three drugs, uh, three three drug trials that has happened, if the patient is not seizure free, then uh, uh, the patient are are categorized as drug resistant epilepsy patients, and. Uh, in drug resistant epilepsy patients, seizures remain uncontrolled by medication. And again, th this is also not uncommon. There are around 30 to 40% of the patients who are drug resistant, and which would be approximately uh, 20 million worldwide and around 3 million in India. And for these patients uh, to identify what's the best line of treatment uh, above and beyond the drug treatment, they are typically recommended to be referred for to a specialized epilepsy center. And in these specialized epilepsy centers, a lot of uh, information is uh, acquired in order to understand uh, the pathology in the brain. So these information can be broadly summarized here uh, in this slide. So uh, we typically functional cues will be obtained. These would be what is the history of epilepsy? What are the seizure patterns, drug history, evidence of any comorbidity, and uh, ECG, EMG, cardiac signals? These would be typically, this will typically, uh, these are some functional cues, um, and they will typically be acquired. The other type of data that would be acquired are the electrical markers. So this can be a prolonged video EEG recording or an invasive recording from SEEG or uh, ECOG electrodes in which the electrodes are placed directly inside the brain. Um, there can also be in some centers, uh, now there is a facility for magnetic or encephalographic recording or fMRI recording. So these recordings are essentially the uh, are different electrical uh, markers and they collect the time series data from the brain. There can also be some anatomical markers, uh, and these anatomical markers would essentially, would essentially be structural MRI or diffusion MRI. And uh, they uh, look at the actual structure of the brain, and there may also be uh, some me metabolic markers. And all these different information are complementary to each other, and they help identify the pathology in the brain. So for instance, here is an example in, on structural MRI of hippocampus sclerosis, where one side, this is, hippocampus is a structure in the brain where one side of the hippocampus appears a little smaller than the other side. And here is an example of focal cortical dysplasia where the gray matter here shown in the, in, in the circle is a little thicker than the rest of the uh, gray matters. So typically a radiologist would be looking for these sort of anatomical markers. After these diagnoses, uh, if the patient is deemed to be a surgical candidate, then a surgical therapy would be recommended. And uh, in the surgical therapy, the aim is to identify the epileptogenic tissue. So the accurate identification of epileptogenic tissue is crucial. And then that, that epileptogenic tissue, which are thought to be causing seizures, are resect, is typically surgically resected. It is also important that any eloquent cortex, which are crucial brain tissues, for example, the tissues responsible for language or motor function, should be avoided during the surgery. Here is an example uh, of temporal lobe epilepsy surgery. So this is the anterior temporal lobe, which is removed. And this is yet another structure, amygdala and hippocampus. So this is amygdala hippocampus tommy. And this is, th that structure is removed. So after the surgery, the patients are usually followed up for assessing how well the surgery, uh, how, how did the surgery work? How, how are the patients responding to assess the surgical outcomes like whether the patient was seizure free after the surgery, or if there was any, if there were any cognitive changes, and uh, uh, based on the International League Against Epilepsy criteria, or another some other uh, criteria, like there is also another scale called Ingle classification. The outcome of the surgery. Uh, in terms of seizure freedom is classified 
So classification of one means that the patient was completely seizure free after the surgery. Classification two means the patient was seizure free, but there were some auras. Three means there were some seizures. Four means there were four to 12 seizures. Five means seizures were occurring regularly. And six means that there was more, is the worst outcome, which means that more the seizures uh, worsened after the surgery. And it is worth noting that the seizure reduction after the surgery is not same in all patients. So some patients, while most patients with anterior temporal lobe resection would be seizure free, there would be some patients who would not be seizure free and still uh, be having some seizures or maybe having daily seizures. The other line of treatment for the drug resistant epilepsy patient is by brain stimulation therapy. So in the brain stimulation therapy as shown in these cartoons, uh, typically the brain is stimulated by electrical pulses. So this is an example of vagus nerve stimulation where the vagus uh, nerve of uh, which is which goes uh, over here. So this this is stimulated. Uh, there are other uh, methods of uh, brain stimulation like cortical responsive stimulation where the cortex is uh, directly stimulated or deep brain stimulation. So this is essentially a palliative option to control seizures in drug resistant epilepsy who are not deemed fit for surgery. Um, and uh, uh, the the seizure uh, the seizure is controlled by direct stimulation of the brain. And here again, uh, different patients would respond differently to stimulation therapies. In some patients, the frequency of the seizures would reduce substantially, whereas in other patients it may not respond, they may not respond. So the main motivation uh, for uh, this work uh, was the challenge that surgery approximately, uh, surgery would, would not work well for 30 to 40% of the patients and they will continue to have a suboptimal seizure outcome. And in case of stimulation, the optimal stimulation protocol or who is likely to respond is unclear. And the multidisciplinary team, which typically looks at all the different uh, data collected before the surgery are not able to gauge this risk fully. And therefore that has implication on clinical decision-making as well as counseling the patients as what they should expect from their treatment. So this is clinic. This is uh, broadly what is what currently happens. Where a large amount of pre-surgical data is acquired, then this is looked by a, a multidisciplinary team, and then a surgery is proposed, or a stimulation uh, is a stimulation protocol is adopted. What we would want to ideally do is to is to feed the multidisciplinary team given their choice of the surgery or proposed stimulation technique about the responses that whether the patient is going to respond well to the surgical therapy or through the stimulation therapy or not and then also to suggest some alternatives that if if this brain area as shown here in red uh, cannot be removed or removal of this would not lead to uh, to seizure freedom what are the other options which uh, uh, the clinical team can look at. And in order to do that effectively, it is very important to uh, develop the personalized biomarkers to understand the mechanism of the disease and also to uh, look at uh, how the brain network reorganizes or would reorganize because of the proposed uh, proposed uh, surgery or stimulation therapy. Now I use the word network here because there is an, there is growing evidence to suggest that brain is a network of interconnected structure and different areas of the brain uh, work in like in in conjunction with each other uh, in, in in form of a web. And epilepsy in that case is a uh, is a network disease 
epilepsy is also been fundamentally known as a dynamical disease because the various time dependent phenomena occurring at different time scales such as neural firing or sleep wake cycle they happen at different time scales and they affect the seizure occurrences and clinically it has been challenging to take into account the different uh, the evolving dynamics of this disorder to develop the effective clinical strategy so there is a growing evidence to suggest that epilepsy the epilepsy is a dynamical network disease and the main premise of what i am going to present uh, in 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 my talk today uh, would be using the brain to study brain as a network so there are two types of brain networks i just wanted to give a quick overview of that so that we are, we we know the terminologies and we are on the same page so one type of brain network is called the structural connectivity structural connectivity means how the brain is anatomically wired these are typically obtained uh, using a combination of diffusion mri and t1 weighted mri structural mri so the diffusion mri tells us how, from the it tells us the diffusion of the water in water molecules so hydrogen how hydrogen ion in the brain and from that we can obtain this tractography uh, we can perform tractography and using different tractography algorithms and we can obtain these tracts from the structural imaging t1 uh, weighted imaging we can subdivide the brain gray matter into different regions of interest which are essentially small pieces of the brain based on cyto architecture or based on some chiral or uh, circle information and then we can we can overlay these two to identify how these different brain areas are connected now these different brain areas then becomes nodes in the network and how they are connected they form the edge and now this can be represented in form of a network as shown here in the in in this figure we can also present this like a matrix where the x and y axes would then be the different regions of interest or nodes and the elements of the matrix would be the edge properties obtained from diffusion mri so there are different properties like fractional isotropy or md and they form the edge of the network so this is giving an indication of how the brain is anatomically wired and this is called structural connectivity there is another type of uh, connectivity that one can obtain from uh, from brain and this is called the functional connectivity in what i am going to present i'll be i have used uh, i have derived functional connectivity from intracranial eeg time series data so this is an example of a of a brain Uh, on which the ecog electrodes are placed each ecog electrode uh, is recording the brain uh, is recording the activity from the cortical tissue underneath and uh, this would typically look like uh, these time series and by using some information theoretic me measures for example correlation the simplest case we can see how much information Uh, how 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 the two uh, time series are correlated and that then forms the elements in this uh, matrix so in this case the rows and columns are the electrode contacts and the elements of the matrix are the correlation between the time series so having this background uh, i will now move on to the main outline of my talk uh where i have applied uh, these uh, uh, i have applied some of the methods in the first and second part to predict surgical outcomes whether the patient would be seizure free or not seizure free in the first part i'll be using the functional connectivity from intracranial eeg recordings and in the second part i have used uh, just the mri uh, non invasive uh, brain images so the structural connectivity then 
I will also uh, show the third part of my talk where uh, uh, where I have used again the MRI uh, data to uh, to look at how uh, to look at why some focal seizures suddenly secondary generalize. And in the fourth part of my talk, I would uh, look. I will show the combination of MRI, fMRI, and dynamical models in context of primary generalized seizures. So while the first three parts are focused on the focal seizures, the fourth part is on the primary generalized seizures. So this is the first part of the talk. And the main objective here is uh, to predict the responses, like whether the surgical outcomes after the surgery, to understand uh, the mechanism that means to quantify the susceptibility of seizures of different cortical areas and to suggest alternative surgical options. So these are some of the papers that uh, where I have applied these approaches and uh, I would refer you uh, to these papers uh, for uh, understanding uh, more about the work. Um, so this is the brief overview of the method. So in this in, in this case, we derive the functional connectivity from the non seizure segment of the data. So this is the data where there are no seizures. And from this segment of the data, we obtain a windowed correlation matrix by windowing the non seizure segment into uh, smaller uh, segments of one second intervals. And then averaging this, to obtain a snapshot of this one hour segment. Now, this functional connectivity is essentially showing how the brain is interacting between different uh, uh, underlying electrodes. And the electrodes are represented here in X and Y axes. Now, having obtained the functional connectivity, we next uh, developed a uh, a computer model of a, a brain, uh, which is essentially just a set of nonlinear differential equations. And uh, the dynamics of this model uh, would, it is a bistable system, and the dynamics, when it is placed at this fixed point, would look something like this. And when the model is placed on the limit cycle over here, then there would be oscillations like this. And these two uh, fixed point and the limit cycle are separated by a separate trix. And often the model will have a transition between the non seizure and the seizure segment uh, when it is driven by noise in this case. So we next developed, after developing this uh, computer model, which can have spontaneous uh, transition between the seizure and the non seizure state. We applied this model on every node of this network. So now the dynamics of every node will not just depend on how the model dynamics uh, evolves, but it will also depend on the connectivity, functional connectivity of the, of the brain, how the brain is topologically connected or how each node is connected to the rest of the network. So here is an example of how the simulated network dynamics looks like. So we can see here that there are some of the electrodes which, uh, which transits from the background state to the seizure state quicker as compared to these nodes, where, which takes a long time to uh, leave the background state and go into the seizure state. And we can quantify this by a terminology uh, called the escape time. That means how much time does it uh, take for a node to leave the background state and go into the seizure state. Now, we applied this technique uh, retrospectively to patients who had focal epilepsy and underwent surgery. And uh, uh, we computed uh, the seizure likelihood at every node for uh, for all of these patients. So here is an example of two patients, patient one and patient two. Uh, 
and uh, we have computed here the simulated seizure likelihood for both these patients. So the areas which are shown in red have a high likelihood of seizures, whereas those in blue have a low likelihood of seizures. So because these patients, this is a retrospective analysis, we already uh, knew what, uh, where the surgery, actual surgery occurred. So in this case, the actual surgery occurred in the same location where the patient, uh, where we predicted that high seizure likelihood. Whereas in patient two, the surgery was done in this area, whereas we predicted this area to have a high simulated seizure likelihood. So our model uh, predicts the simulated seizure likelihood correctly for some patients, but do not predict uh, it do not do it doesn't match with the actual surgical resection for others. Now, how can we use this uh, to make a prediction? So we simulate virtual surgeries in the model. So by simulating virtual surgeries, I mean that uh, this is if this is the original network, if we remove the connections corresponding to some of the nodes then uh, uh, it is equivalent in the model, it is equivalent to restricting those nodes from contributing to the rest of the network dynamics. So we can we remove those connections and we simulate the model and computed the reduction in the Caesar likelihood. And then we performed, uh, we removed the same number of, uh, uh, same number of nodes randomly. So this is a random removal of the same number of uh, uh, connections here. And we again simulate the model and then we compute the reduction in the Caesar likelihood. So we decided that if this surgery was a good surgery, then the reduction in the Caesar likelihood will be more than a random surgery when the, where the, resection, resection, where the uh, reduction would be less. So let's see what happens in these cases. So in this case, the simulated, uh, uh, the simulated uh, seizure likelihood was higher for these brain tissues and therefore the escape time after removal of these tissues was higher. And therefore we see that for the actual resection, the escape time is higher as compared to the random resection. That means nodes are taking more time to go into the seizure. So escape time and uh, seizure likelihood are inversely related. So therefore in this patient, we would predict a good outcome. In this patient, however, with the actual uh, resection cause well, the escape time for the actual resection or the simulated seizure likelihood uh, was lower than the random resection. And therefore we would predict a poor outcome from this patient. Now let's see what the actual outcome was. So the actual outcome for this patient was good and we predicted that to be a good outcome. And the actual outcome for this patient was poor and we predicted uh, from the model that this patient would have had a poor outcome. So we applied this on 16 patients in the first paper and uh, recently we have uh, applied a similar approach uh, in uh, uh, more than 50 patients. And we found that uh, uh, by using the, this approach, uh, we can predict the surgical uh, outcomes uh, with an accuracy of about 81.3% and specificity of 75%. So it is important to see here that like uh, for the non seizure free cases, out of eight of these patients, we correctly predict the seizure outcome for uh, six patients. So this is uh, uh, this. This would so typically all these patients uh, were uh, were they went with an expectation of uh, being completely seizure free after the surgery. But then, if we can predict which of these patients would be not seizure free then either the clinical team can uh, perform an alternative resection or at the very minimum, they can be counseled about what can be expected uh, 
because of this therapy. Now, in this modeling framework, we can also look at if a particular area cannot be removed, then what alternatives we can suggest. So, for instance, in this, in this, uh, uh, in this case, obviously, we can uh, once we have mapped the uh, Caesar likelihood of different brain areas in the model, we can suggest what areas can be uh, removed in order to achieve Caesar freedom. So this sort of alternative, uh, this gives gives an alternative uh, to the clinical team as uh, uh, if a surgery cannot be done or if the surgery is too close to the tissues which cannot be removed, the eloquent cortex, then where else to resect? Now, this was all done for, uh, using the functional connectivity from invasive intracranial recording. The second part of the work uh, is about uh, using the non-invasive uh, recordings like MRI. And here again, I would the objective is to predict the surgical outcomes, both in the short term and to assess whether the surgical how the surgical outcomes are in the long term. Uh, to look at the mechanism. In this case, the mechanism would be the biomarkers, like what a, what uh, what mechanism allow would allow us to develop a personalized biomarkers for patient selection, and to assess the network reorganization before and after surgery. So these are uh, the papers uh, where which I have. Uh, uh, based on which what I'm going to what I'm going to explain next. Uh, so it's based on these papers. So I would uh, uh, suggest to read this uh, for uh, any further understanding of this. Yes, and also please feel free to email me um, if, uh, if you want to get in touch. So the main premise of this work is uh, is that epilepsy is more widespread uh, disorder than what it was previously thought. And the intracranial electrodes that I showed previously, they only capture a particular part of the brain. MRI uh, records the structure from the whole brain. And it is, not, it, it is quite intuitive to imagine that there, the, the, how the surgery would be would not just depend on how the brain was before the surgery, but also on the surgery itself. And if you look at this picture where we have the uh, tissue that is to be resected shown in red here, then we, there are actually two networks here. One is the network that was present before the surgery, and the other is the network that would remain after the surgery or would remain unaffected uh, as a result of surgery. So the data that we have used here is from our uh, excellent collaborators from UCL. Uh, and uh, we have data for uh, uh, a total of uh, 51 patients in this, uh, in, in this study. So 34 of these patients had ILA outcome one, which means they were completely seizure free. Eight of them had an ILA outcome of two. That means these patients were seizure free but they were having auras after the surgery. And nine of them were not seizure free. That means they were having an ILA surgical outcome of three and above. So for each of these patients, uh, they, they, they were followed up, up to five years. And the ILA, uh, 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 record, the ILA seizure outcome scales were updated at every year. And therefore, we could determine which of these patients would have had a relapse of seizures uh, at a later time point. So for each of these patients, uh, a T1-weighted MRI was acquired, a diffusion MRI was acquired before the surgery, and a T1 MRI was acquired after the surgery. So we can see here that this part of the brain uh, was resected, which appears black here. And this is the this is the image T1 MRI before the surgery. So the first step in this uh, uh, 
in this analysis was to draw the resection mask like what where exactly the caesar uh, surgery was performed what tissue were exactly removed so we did that by overlaying the pre operative and post operative t1 mri and then drawing these resection mask manually now these resection mask can then be overlaid with the uh, with the diffusion mri data and then we can ignore the information of the surgery to obtain a network as shown here so this network the x and y uh, in the x and y axes are the different regions of interest obtained by a parcellation scheme and the elements shown here like before is how many traps are connecting different uh, regions now we can include the information of the surgery by removing all the fiber tracts which intersected with the resection mask and then obtain a network uh, of those connections which would remain unaffected after the surgery or we, we, which we which we hope to uh, which we expect to remain unaffected as a result of surgery so we call it a surgically spared network which is a sub network of the pre surgery network but without those connections which were impacted by the surgery so here is the same information presented differently so we have uh, to summarize we have uh, uh, structural mri before the surgery we have the structural structural mri after the surgeries we have a diffusion mri which is mapping how the brain is uh, wired and we have a pre surgery network and a surgically spared network by taking the difference we can see how widespread was the impact of the surgery and as we can clearly see from this figure that even though the surgery was performed just at this location because brain is a network the impact is not limited to just this hemisphere it is it also impacts the other hemisphere so the surgery has a widespread impact and it is specific to every patient depending on how the surgery was performed so in this analysis we have uh, we standardized the network of every patient with respect to the data of 29 controls so all these controls and patients um uh, the 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 mri data was acquired at the same center using the same mri protocols and therefore uh, we can compare them uh, directly so for every patient for every edge we can see how far away it is from a distribution of healthy subject and then z score z score uh, every connection to obtain a z score network so a high value of z score means that means a highly abnormal connection a z score which is within the range of uh, uh, of of the control distribution means that they are in the normal range to that of a controlled deviation now we can include the information of the surgery on this uh, z transformed brain network to get a surgically spared brain network like this and then we can assess how these different how many abnormal connections are going at a particular brain region so this is an example of how to compute the abnormality in every brain area so let's say this brain area which is called the precentral gyrus uh, color coded here in uh, in orange this has six abnormal connections which means six connections are abnormal uh, where abnormality is given for z threshold greater than 2 as opposed to 29 total connections which it has and therefore the node of normality is just 6 by 29 which is 20.6% in this example uh this brain area has just four connections abnormal but it has fewer 14 connections and therefore the abnormality here uh, is 4 over 14 which is 28.5 so this way we can compute the abnormality node of normality at every brain area for the choice of our uh, z score thresholds which need not be fixed to any particular value 
we can uh, sweep it at different range. And then we can determine how many nodes were abnormal. So that that also, uh, so to determine the, uh, how many nodes were abnormal, we use another threshold that beyond what percent we would consider a node abnormal. Is 20.6 enough to say that this node is abnormal? Or uh, is 10% uh, enough to say that that node is abnormal? So that is, uh, that is a matter of choice. And therefore, we do not pick from any particular region, but rather we sweep it across different range of thresholds. And uh, so in this two-dimensional grid, we obtain, uh, we map the abnormality information in the brain and how abnormal they were. They were. And this is done for how much abnormality is, is would remain before the surgery and how much abnormality is expected to remain after the surgery. And this is a value uh, per patient which we then use uh, along with common clinical predictor to apply to fit a, uh, in a machine learning algorithm uh, to predict the outcome at year one, to estimate what are the likelihood uh, uh, of a seizure relapsing at later year, and also to see if we can predict for every patient how well they are going to do after the surgery, which means ILA scores of every patient. So this is the overview of the method. Uh, let's have a look at how this method works. So this is an example of four patients, patient, uh, patient 22. So this patient had a good outcome, uh, which means they had an ILA one outcome. And uh, they, the, this is the, number, the total number of abnormal nodes in this patient. This patient had, again, was ILA two, which, which means they were only having auras and the abnormal nodes here were less. The patient in panel C was ILA2, but then upon follow-up relapsed. So at, at year one, both patient B and patient, patient shown in panel B and panel C, they had ILA2, but the patient in panel C relapsed at a later year. And this patient had more number of abnormal nodes in the brain. This patient, shown in panel D, had a lot of abnormal nodes, and this patient was never seizure-free after the surgery. So this is uh, so we see that the abnormality load or the total number of abnormal no nodes in the brain is correlated with is associated with the surgical outcomes and seizure relapse. And this is not just valid for these four patients. We apply this, uh, we test it statistically for in the entire cohort. And we see that patients who have a, a poor surgical outcome have a statistically higher, uh, significantly higher abnormal no abnormality load than patients who had a good surgical outcomes. And even if these patients who had good surgical outcomes at year one, that means if they if they are seizure free at year one, they are more likely to relapse at later year. So the seizure may reoccur to them again if the abnormality load in these patients are higher. So if the number of abnormal nodes were higher, and even if they were they were seizure free in the first year after the surgery, they are more likely to have a seizure at a later year. So when we use these uh, network measures of uh, surgically spared network and uh, surgically spared node abnormality or pre-surgery node abnormality, along with the common, common uh, clinical variables like age of surgery, uh, the evidence where this, on which side, left or the right hemisphere, the surgery was performed. So these are the different clinical predictors clinical variables for every patient. And for every patient, we have network variable, uh, net, uh, that is uh, surgically spared node abnormality and pre-surgery node abnormality. So we trained an SVM model for uh, uh, all these different predictors. And here I'm plotting the AUC, or the area under the ROC curve. And then we rank all these features in the order of their importance and recursively remove the less important features 
in order to determine that what are the where the AUC uh, maximizes or what combinations of features are most predictive. So we see that the abnormality, firstly, we see that the abnormality which is expected to remain after the surgery is consistently uh, have a higher feature importance than the rest of the features here. And the AUC that can be achieved, uh, the highest AUC that we can, we can achieve here, uh, this is pretty flat, but if we just have to choose a particular point, so if we choose here the point shown in star, we see that AUC here is around 0.91. So we can correctly predict uh, for out of nine patients who are having, uh, who had a bad outcome, uh, that they will have a bad outcome after the surgery. This also gives an indication of uh, like if in some centers, not all the clinical variables are recorded, then what are the best set of clinical variables that has to be, that, that needs to be recorded in order to achieve a high, uh, high prediction accuracy. More importantly, in this approach, we look at not just a binary classification of which patient will be seizure-free or which patient will not be seizure-free. We also look at the probabilities by which a, a particular patient is classified as either being seizure-free or not seizure-free. And this probability uh, we noted was correlated with the ILA uh, seizure outcome at year one. That means every patient get a, get a probability value based on non-invasive MRI data and the clinical variables. And that probability value is showing how likely they are going to have a seizure relapse. So this patient who had a bad ILA outcome, uh, who, had a, uh, who had ILA outcome of uh, five or a bad surgical outcome, and had seizures, uh, continued seizures after the surgery, had a, pro had a probability of one. Whereas these patients who were ILA2, they have a lower probability. So we can we can then counsel if we have these uh, probability for every patient, we can at least counsel every patient that what are their chances of seizure recurrence uh, after the after this after the after the surgery. So. Um, we investigated the predicted uh, likelihood of seizure relapse at every year, and we find that the predicted likelihood of seizure relapse at every year is higher amongst those patient group who had a relapse than the patients who didn't have relapse. So the predicted likelihood of seizure likelihood uh, uh, of seizure relapse, predicted likelihood of seizure relapse is uh, uh, associated with. Uh, the actual relapses at later year. So in this framework, we can also investigate how much reduction is in the abnormality uh, happens as a result of surgery. And here uh, we are just noting, I just briefly mentioned this, that we are noting that uh, in, the, in the good outcome patients, the abnormality is reduced in more number of lobes than in the poor outcome patients. So the, so the surgery in the good outcome patients reduces the abnormality in more uh, number of loads than the poor outcome patients. So the good outcome patients, the takeaways are that the good outcome patients have a lower abnormality to start with and the surgery reduces the abnormality in, in those patients more than the poor outcome patients shown here in red. And like I said before, we uh, we invest, we do not cherry pick our result from any particular uh, Z score or node abnormality threshold. These are consistent across the different choice of thresholds. So the main takeaway here is that uh, non-invasive personalized predictors of surgical outcomes can be developed. This can complement uh, the current standard of individualized prediction, which relies mainly on clinical variables. And we can then counsel the patients about what are their chances of surgical outcomes 
if we know which patient if an, if we know that a patient has a high likelihood of relapse we can also follow up those patients longer and closely monitor uh, monitor them for any additional drug intervention to stop the seizures from the affected so there is value in uh, making these uh, predictions about uh, every patient there are indeed some limitations like we do not really know the biological significance of a node abnormality which can be and why does it occur it can be either the node abnormalities uh, can uh, can be a result of either a network reorganization in response to seizures so the brain network has changed because of the seizures it can be a neurodegenerative process it can also be a structure facilitating seizures or a combination and in this study it we couldn't detangle the interrelationship between these and the other limitation is that the remission and relapse process is more complex in the long term where in this study we only investigate the uh chances of one relapse after the surgery so moving on to the third part of the study uh the this is about again using mri uh but then to investigate why some seizures which starts focal uh, which 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 has a local origin in the brain it uh generalizes and recruits all the different brain areas and these seizures are very severe they are very they they the most severe form of epileptic seizures because it causes a tonic clonic uh, motion and the patients are at a very high risk to sudden unexpected death or a seizure related injury and therefore the question that we ask in this study is that why do some seizures uh which starts in the temporal lobe remain local in some patients but it generalizes in other patients and again the hypothesis here is based on the networks so the network alterations we hypothesize that the alterations or the all the abnormality is in the brain network for the patients who have secondary generalized seizures are more so the data that we have here is for 83 patients 60 of them had a history of secondary generalized tonic clonic seizures whereas 23 of them didn't and do not have a history of secondary generalized seizures and we also have the data for 29 controls and these are the other demographic information for these patients very briefly the method here is to investigate uh, we we wish to investigate the abnormality in the the network abnormalities in the brain So this is a toy example imagine this is a patient with uh, six brain areas represented here by six nodes and these are the controls and we have got two groups a group in which the seizures starts locally but generalizes and the other groups where the seizures start locally but do not generalize so we can look at the connections of this group with respect to the equivalent connection of controls and we can estimate a t score between these distribution and based on a t score threshold we can determine if if a particular uh, connection is uh, normal or if it is abnormal so in this case this is uh, we see the abnormal connections are shown in red and we see that the patients who are who secondary generalized have a more widespread abnormal connections as compared to the patients who do not secondary generalize with respect to controls so we this is the method in general that we wish to apply and this is uh, this is the hypothesis that we wish to check and we benchmark these uh, networks statistically using network based statistics uh developed by andrew salski uh the node abnormality approach as i described previously again we apply the same approach here where each connection is uh, standardized with respect to a control distribution and then we see how abnormal a particular connection is based on the z score values we 
deem the connection as normal and abnormal based on uh, the z-score. And then we compute the node abnormality for each of the nodes as shown here. Then we determine that beyond how much percentage we would, cons we would, we would consider a node abnormal. If we deem that beyond 50%, the node has to be abnormal. Then in this case, the node abnormality or the abnormality load for this network, this toy model is three. And this can be this uh, abnormality load can be computed for every patient and controls by taking a control out and comparing the control with the remaining control distribution. So we apply this technique and we find that the patients who have secondary generalized seizures have a much uh, the, the network alteration in patients who do not have secondary generalized seizures is limited mainly to the temporal and the frontal areas. Whereas in the patients who have secondary generalized seizures, the network alterations is, are quite widespread. In terms of abnormality, we again see that the patients who have secondary generalized seizures have a statistically higher abnormality load as compared to the patients who do not have secondary generalized seizures and the controls are further lower. So in conclusion, uh, the main takeaways for this is uh, there is a wider network alterations in patients with secondary generalized seizures as opposed to those uh, patients without secondary generalized seizures. And we can identify based on this, the susceptibility of a patient to have a secondary generalized tonic, tonic seizures. And this is a high clinical value uh, in identifying those patients who are at the risk of having, uh, ha having a secondary generalized seizures, especially in the epilepsy monitoring units where uh, patients are often, the drug and the, uh, regimen that they are, on, they are on are reduced, and then they have an increased risk of having a secondary generalized seizures. So the final part of the talk is uh, again uh, is uh, so I'll move now from focal seizures to generalized seizures. The idea here is to identify the therapeutic targets, the mechanism of why uh, uh, a healthy brain may develop epilepsy, so epileptogenesis mechanism, and also to look at uh, the stimulation protocols in the brain. So again, these are some of the papers that uh, um, that I, I would refer to for uh, for the details of this work. And uh, uh, the main hypothesis here is this: that so, firstly, the idiopathic generalized epilepsy is is a is an umbrella term, and it comprises a few different types of seizures, like gen generalized tonic-clonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, or absent seizures. Unlike the focal epilepsy uh, or focal seizures, here the source or the origin of seizures are not known, and there is no uh, obvious brain abnormalities present on MRI. So this is how a clinical EEG would look like for patients who have idiopathic generalized epilepsy. So they have very typical spike and wave discharges. And you can see that uh, these electrodes, they all go into the seizures abruptly and then they suddenly stops. The main research question here is that, are there any structural abnormalities in the brain and it is going unnoticed by simple visual inspection? The other questions are that, how do the epilepsy manifest? Like the epileptogenesis mechanism, and why do the seizures spread so quickly in the both hemispheres bilaterally? So the data set that we had here is uh, uh, for 14 patients and 18 controls. And uh, these patients had uh, a mix of different types of seizures. Um, we used an advanced uh, method for neuroimaging, uh, which maps the abnormalities in the tracts very specifically at local, uh, locally. So in this case, the, in a whole tract-based approach, if an abnormality is present here and there's not enough abnormality at the back here, and if you take the average of all of these connections, then the net value would become lower. 
So the approach that we use here is more sensitive to detect these local abnormalities, and it has been developed um, and validated in other studies. For example, in this study, this is the site of the lesion, and the approach was able to detect uh, which part of the brain is abnormal. So a general overview of uh, uh, how we do this. So we have the diffusion MRI of every patient in the native space. From the diffusion MRI, we have the, we obtain a connectometry uh, a database, a connectometry database. This database is uh, shared openly. Um, and you can download this uh, if you wish to perform the study yourself. Uh, I would refer you to this paper uh, to to look to to get a link to the data. Um, so following this, we look at the tracks whether the tracks is reduced or it is increased with respect to controls. We statistically validate the tracks as it is increased or reduced by computing uh, the statistical significance between, between the control and the IgE uh, idiopathic generalized epilepsy group. And then we correct these p-values for multiple comparisons, finally uh, obtaining the tracks which are increased or reduced. We have a dynamical model in which, which we inform uh, these changes in the tracks in the model. So the model essentially there is a four compartment. Uh, so this is uh, the pyramidal neuron and the inhibitory neuron representing the cortex and the thalamus is represented here by these TC and RE. And these are essentially uh, differential equations uh, which, uh, which simulates, which upon simulation, would produce uh, would reproduce the features which are very similar to actual seizures as shown here. So the first thing that we applied uh, we looked at was uh, given the prior evidence that there are specific regions in the brain which shows a functional decrease in patients as compared to controls. Uh, we looked at if in those specific regions where there is a functional reduction, specifically the regions connecting this uh, posterior cingulate cortex shown here in, uh, in green with the medial prefrontal cortex shown here, shown here in red. If the tracts which are connecting that, so this is the anatomical connection between those areas, if that has uh, a similar reduction in patients as compared to controls. And we do see that. So the patients have, have a reduced integrity in the tract as compared to controls. We repeated this in the, in the whole brain network and we found a very typical pattern that the tracts which are connecting the cortico-cortical connections are increased, where the tracts which are, which are from the thalamus to the cortex, uh, going to the cortex is reduced. So here we have these uh, corticocortical tracts which are increased and the corticothalamic tracts are reduced. So based on this uh, data, so each dot here is a patient and uh, based on this data, we can, we can obtain a decision boundary which best separates the patients and control. And we can see that in this two, by taking these two features together of corticocortical connection, and corticothalamic connections, we can separate patients and control pretty well. So now we uh, simulate the model. So firstly, we optimize the parameter in the model such that it replicates what is clinically seen. So this is an example of a clinical seizure. And this is an example of the seizure simulated from the model. And you can see the striking similarity between how the how the model uh, simulated seizure and the clinical seizure looks like. So once the parameter uh, of this model is uh, is is uh, determined, uh, the parameter regimes are determined, where these different dynamics can be simulated. We investigated by changing the parameters how the model simulation how the model is uh, uh, simulated. So this is the so we specifically were interested in these four parameters of the model. 
which are representing the cortico. So C1 is representing the cortico cortical connection, and C8, C7, and C9 are representing the cortico thalamic connections. So these are the different biological uh, connections, and we we did a parameter search by changing these uh, cortico cortical and cortico uh, reticular connections. C1 and C7, C1 and C9 to see where this pattern in the model would replicate with what we see in the data. So here we see that the decision boundary has a positive slope and it is with the variation between C1 and C8, C1 and C8, we see, uh, we see a similar replication uh, to that of the data. So then we, once we have this, we can hypothesize the mechanism that a healthy subject, which is lying over here, might develop uh, epilepsy if either the cortico-cortical connections are reduced or if the cortico-reticular connections are increased or in some combination so that it moves from this regime in, the parameter sp in, in this uh, uh, parameter space to this regime. And these are the same two dimensional slices shown in the model uh, in the three dimensions. So we can also use the similar approach uh, to look at uh, uh, to, to look at how to, de to determine the optimal brain stimulation protocols. So here we have a patient, a clinical EEG of a patient, and this is the model simulated EEG. Now, once the model parameter is determined, we can uh, we, we can design a control stimulus which would stop the seizures from occurring, and we can see how much strength that uh, stimulus has in different part of the brain. And we can see that that the stimulus that is required to stop the seizures is not the same everywhere. So, this more is stronger stimulus is needed in this area as opposed to this area. So this essentially shows that uh, different brain areas might be might need it to be stimulated with different control strengths or different uh, to stop the seizures and essentially the heterogeneity within the patients. So in summary, the the treatment gaps that we have tried to address in context of brain surgery is uh, is to identify why seizure uh, reoccur for approximately 40 to 50% of the patients in long term. There are many other treatment gaps and areas of research uh, needed in this area. So firstly, in, in context of cognitive deficit, so can we predict uh, or design a surgery in a way that we can reduce the cognitive deficits that might be arising as a result of surgery, such as loss of language, memory, or vision. And also it is very important to give alternative choices uh, to our clinical team, uh, especially in cases of uh, uh, extratemporal lobe epilepsy surgeries. In context of uh, brain stimulation, uh, we have the stimulation. It is, uh, it is crucial to determine the stimulation parameters, what's the amplitude, frequency, and duration of the stimulation to best stop seizures. Where should we stop? Where should we apply these stimulus? Does it? Uh, what are the strategic locations in the brain which can terminate the seizures? And also, some mechanism uh, to alter the brain states. So, with this, I would like to conclude my talk, and I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, the lab uh, where I'm currently working, uh, working, working in, in Newcastle. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. I would yeah. be happy to answer any question. Yeah, Nishan, thank you. So I will be presenting uh, the set of questions that I was posted in the okay. YouTube. And uh, okay. you can stop your presentation and I will present now on my screen. All right, okay. So just a minute, uh, I'm going on the sharing mode. Oh, so, so I should stop this. Okay. Yeah, you stop and I will present. Uh, okay. So, uh, Nishan, there are a lot of questions. So, uh, be quick in taking up the, uh, be, be very brief in just giving an idea uh, because right. I think many, many uh, questions that have come.
so it gives me a idea that how good the presenter you are and we have really received uh, a lot of good comments about the style of your presentation so you can understand there are a lot of questions your topic is definitely interesting so we start with the first question ayashi ganguli you can read the question i hope you can All see right. I, I yes yeah, I, I i i can see uh, so uh, i'll i'll try to answer them all uh, briefly uh, so does the localized seizures have less effect on patient than uh, generalized one or do they have the same so well i think uh, uh, the seizures the, essentially what what the question is that that uh, if uh, the patients who have focal epilepsy Uh, less severe than the patients who have generalized epilepsy. Uh, there are different types of seizures, and the uh, and the seizures, uh, the generalized type seizures or generalized epilepsy typically happens in the first two decade of life, and uh, often considered a developmental uh, has a developmental basis to it, uh, as opposed to focal epilepsy. But in terms of the severity or the effect, I think uh, uh, it is really very patient specific and it's very difficult to comment on anything uh, in general so the next uh, the treatment also is different uh, for what drugs they have to be treated with eg bandwidth is below 30 hertz while for the focal epileptic seizures h4 are considered the potential biomarker yes uh, my question is taking into account for the design of pre amplification of the recording circuit what should be the range and the allowable for the overall so this this is a good question uh, so it, there there have been some studies which are looking at the predictive values of high frequency oscillations um, as a potential biomarker they it it doesn't have and those studies we what we have looked at are the network biomarkers of uh, uh seizure outcome uh i think this is a very good question uh to relate how hfos might be might be relating to uh the network uh, measures but they are complementary and uh, i think uh, uh yeah uh, uh, they are different biomarkers and there is a need to study uh, all these different biomarkers uh together uh to identify which patient uh, might be benefiting uh, in a larger cohort what uh, what's the reason for abnormal signal that leads okay so they're different so uh, what usually is understood is uh, the epileptic seizures uh, uh happens because of uh, uh, imbalance between the excitation and the inhibition in the brain so either there is too much excitation so there are two types of so either there too much excitation which is not uh, which and lesser inhibition or there is a reduced inhibition as a result there is an increased um, uh, increased uh, excitation um okay next question then what actually happens to the neuron which arises in epilepsy well this is again a good question uh, looking at the cellular mechanism or at the cellular level how the seizures would uh, uh, would manifest so um, so like i said there is th that's the mechanism at the at the cellular level and uh, the mechanisms at uh, that we are looking at it is uh, at a population of neuron which is which is where we record these uh, epileptogenic activities from intracranial egs uh, there is a balance between imbalance between the excitation and the inhibition at a cellular level which is thought to be causing seizures how long is severe they can vary uh, not sure if this was with regard to uh, with regard to seizures or i think uh, i do not understand this question properly sorry uh, how successful is brain surgery for epilepsy well surgery for so 
in case of drug, this is a very important question that how successful is the brain surgery for epilepsy? Particularly for drug resistant epilepsy, uh, there is benefit in, uh, in, uh, in going for the surgery as opposed to not going for the surgery or continuing to take medication. And there are lots of studies which advocates uh, advocates brain surgery over a prolonged medication uh, for drug resistant epilepsy. And uh, even though the patient have a bad, a poor surgical outcome, it doesn't mean that there was no reduction from the baseline seizures. Uh, there is indeed uh, like uh, I, ILAE outcome of three means that the seizures have reduced to you know, for more than 50% than it was before surgery. The goal is to predict uh, which patient, uh, what is what, what a patient should expect after the surgery. But uh, I, I, uh, at no point, uh, I think uh, uh, there is, at no point uh, there is any recommendation that epilepsy surgery should not be taken uh, for drug resistant epilepsy. I think there are good uh, evidence to suggest that surgery is better over anti-epileptic drug treatments um, in controlling seizures which is the best modality to detect epilepsy in early stage. EEG, usually, typically EEG is uh, uh, the, the most common modality, uh, which is used in non-specialized centers uh, to detect, to diagnose epilepsy are uh, EEGs. How does the anti-epileptic drug affect the immunity? Different anti-epileptic drugs have different, uh, different effects and side effects. Uh, Seizures have, uh, yes, so seizures, uh, prolonged seizures, okay, can, uh, it does have uh, effect on uh, uh, on neurons because, uh, uh, because the neurons and also on the network. So surgery has been found to work better in patients who, uh, who have gone for surgery earlier rather than later because the seizures can cause structural changes in the brain and make them more intractable uh, to surgery has been used to this. Metabolic markers are often like uh, using uh, SPECT or PET MRI, uh, the uptake of uh, uh, the, uh, the up, so the metabolic markers essentially would, would measure the uptake of uh, um, sugar, for example. Okay. Uh, and there's F, uh, yes, so it's basically using SPECT and PECT. And there is F, uh, I don't remember the name now. If it is cured, is there another chance that it may? Yes, so Caesar rec cured means that, so that's why we need to follow up the patients. So if uh, we follow up the patients for a long period of time, then uh, uh, there are there are cases where uh, the seizures were totally patients were totally seizure free in the first year after the surgery, but over a longer follow up, they relapsed. Uh, yes, so there is a chance, but uh, it, it's very variable. I, I have uh, investigated only the chances of one relapse but the relapse pattern is more uh, complex. The relapse can be in one year and then the other year, there may not be a relapse. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's more complex than what I have uh, the relapse pattern. Reasons for not responding to brain stimulation. Um, there may be uh, many reasons. Uh, one is uh, maybe the frequency. Uh, so this is an active research area where when to stimulate, where to stimulate and how to stimulate. Uh, to be determined. And also there may be a hypo one hypothesis can be that the patients have a lot of abnormalities in the brain uh, and they might be stimulated at the wrong place, which is therefore not causing the seizures to stop. So the whole takeaway message that I would want to give is that what we, what we are trying, there's a huge need for precision medicine and to personalize the medicine, uh, the therapy for every individual patient rather than uh, one fit all approach. Um,
and especially in context of brain disorders is the the uh, uh, the brain itself is very heterogeneous and uh, how the epilepsy affects the brain is very heterogeneous what makes seizures stop by themselves in a few minutes well the, we don't know uh, the seizure why does the seizure terminate this is a, a good question uh, my question is what are the parameters to be chosen when it comes to treatment via personalized medicine rather than conventional yes so a personalized medicine treatment uh, would fit the parameter to every individual patient based on uh, their data rather than uh, and, and then see on that uh, on that model how it works for that individual patient rather than taking the mean of a, of a, of a sample is epilepsy disease genetic in gen genetic generalized so there are two types of epilepsies uh, there are some genetic basis to epilepsies epilepsy can also be acquired as a result of injury in uh, uh, the the chances of uh, that happening uh, the incidence of that happening in an older at an older age is uh, uh, is more but epilepsy is uh, some some epilepsies are definitely genetic in nature and hence the name genetic generalized epilepsy does it have uh, if it is genetic in nature then it may have an effect uh, but uh, uh, like not all genes are expressed in the offsprings uh, so i think uh, there are some specific genes okay that would it, it depends whether the genes are expressed or not so yeah which software have you used for studying the patient thing so all these models are coded up in matlab uh, i and the codes uh, for the second work, for the second project and uh, yeah they are all coded up in matlab and i'm happy to uh, this some of the codes are already there in the public domain and uh, if you take up the work okay i'm happy to share the codes can the study of biological consequence of genetic mutation by genetic mutation uh, cure for it. we don't know enough about this i don't know sorry what is the main difference between eeg and mri which is more effective in it i think is both the methods are complementary to each other and they detect different things eeg is uh, eeg records the electrical activity uh, over time and uh, it can it detects when the seizures happens then there's a marked change in eeg patterns mri looks at the structure of the brain if there is any visible abnormality in the brain which is causing the seizures so there are different modalities have complementary information i think they're both important uh, can stimulation affect other part of the brain it does affect other part of the brain uh, just like surgery so uh, because it is like a network is there any method to identify it we do not know uh, i think that this is a, a question which i don't know the answer of what type of biomarker has been used to diagnose this disorder like it has come up in, in the previous question hfo using invasive recording okay there are some biomarkers of abnormalities that i have a uh, uh, device here and uh, they are all they all needs to be replicated in a larger cohort in a multi center setting before it translates to clinic and uh, that's currently underway uh personalized predict developed neurological disorders there are there is a lot of research uh, about the to, to detect mild cognitive impairment uh, no sorry not mild sorry a uh, lot of research to detect Alzheimer's at an early age, um, in around fifties. I'm not very aware of that work, no, or that literature. Have the results fluctuated on the basis of gender? So no, the results were not fluctuated on the basis of gender. Uh, is uh, is balanced, uh, and we regress out the age and gender uh, wherever uh, we we see a correlation with the age or gender. stem cells i don't know uh, I, i sorry i don't know much about stem cells uh, 
but there is a cell therapy is a different area altogether which is being looked at memory of a person be transferred i don't know <laughs> this is, is it uh, can these methods be used to assess other neural disease there there is a lot of uh, work uh, going on in dementia uh, and other areas i i do not i'm not very well versed with those literature so i would not want to comment on that can spinal cord injury result in seizures there are some injuries which can cause seizures uh, so it's called focal acquired epilepsies um, i do not know if uh, i think it depends on specific like specific patient specific scenarios like if there is an infection that has gone up to the brain then it might cause but if it is in the other part of the body uh, then it may not cause is very specific to every individual what injury radiation therapy laser ab ablation is uh, is is a well accepted uh, technique uh, for surgery uh, especially for removing the amygdala and uh, hippocampus in the brain um it can in theory be used to remove the abnormal tissues and it is used to remove laser ablation uh, to uh, to ablate the uh, sclerotic hippocampus uh, to to uh, uh, for performing amygdala hippocampotomy what are focal seizures so the focal seizures are the seizures which starts at a particular location in the brain and then spreads right so uh, this much questions we had uh, nishant uh, and uh, and and uh, uh, i would say that it was very nicely explained <laughs> and uh, you were very contained people people could really get uh, uh, get uh, uh, what you wanted to explain they could really understand as they have expressed their views in the Uh, common box uh, so so it is it is good to know that you have transformed into a good teacher too uh, along with <laughs> research so uh, that's uh, uh, so uh, we will share definitely all the feedbacks that we have received from the participants with you and it was really a fantastic uh, presentation uh, it's an area which is really very challenging and the mixing uh, medical science uh, with uh, the concept of uh, computer science a uh, little bit of control and system theory so it was highly yeah. interdisciplinary and as uh, it as the department you work is a translational and clear research so definitely you are seeing that the theories that you are using get translated into some sort of uh, Uh, technology for the benefit of uh, some section of people so well done uh, uh, it's good exposure Thank for you. us to know about this cutting edge technology and what all work is going around the world i i i definitely believe that our participants have greatly benefited out of this uh, new type of work that you have shared with all of us and i believe some of them might be working in this area also in india okay so yeah Um, Nishant, uh, thanks uh, from our organizer side for uh, sharing your time and uh, sharing your expertise uh, with us and with uh, the entire scientific community who was listening to you in YouTube uh, all across India and world. And uh, on behalf of uh, NIT Silchar, I would like to uh, thank you and express our gratitude. Uh, for sharing ideas and expertise so thank you very much nishant and wish you a happy life healthy life and stay safe during this time thank you sir. thank you my pleasure my pleasure in, uh, to talk uh, to be able to present to all of you yeah so thank you very much thank you sir thank you
हेलो हेलो यस यस सर योर माइक इज म्यूटेड आई एम नॉट स्पीकिंग एनीथिंग ओके सो शुड वी कंक्लूड सर यस 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 ओके सर ओके